My name is Didi Minkidi, and I'm one of the owners at the Gorilla Poetry Bookshop. Um, and we're excited today to welcome two um, wonderful poets, one from LA and one from Midwest, Wisconsin, but joining us from Iowa now. Um, so I'm just gonna do a brief introduction, but feel free to, you know, at the end, tell us more about upcoming appearances or, or direct us to anything else that we should know or might wanna know about you. Um, so Victoria, I believe is going to read first. Uh, Victoria Chang is a multifaceted writer. She is a poet, um, a novelist and an author of children books. Um, her poetry books include Obit, Barbie Chang, The Boss, Salvinia Molesta, and Circle. Um, she's the recipient of the Los Angeles Books, Los Angeles Times Book Prize, the Annisfield Wolf, Wolf Book Award, and the Penn Volkler Award. Um, she was also a finalist for the National Books Critics Circle Prize and the Griffin Poetry Prize. Um, she's the author of a children's book called Is Mommy? and illust um, illustrated by Marta Frazzi and named a New York Times notable book and a middle school grade novel, Love, Love. She lives in Los Angeles and is the program chair of Antioch University's low residency MFA program. Her book, Dear Memory, um, came out just a few weeks ago. Um, and so hopefully she's gonna read some from that tonight. Welcome, Victoria. Thank you. Um Thanks. It's so nice to meet you, Didi, and it's just lovely to be here. Um, and I really appreciate you all inviting us to do this. And Nikki, of course, it's always great to, to be in your presence. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of screen sharing, if that's okay with you all, because I have some visual elements into your memory. And then I thought I'd just put some poems on there as well for accessibility reasons. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen. So I'm gonna read a few poems um, first, mostly because it's what I'm used to and comfortable with. <laughs> and then I'll do a little bit of other um, reading from Dear Memory, my new book. So I'm gonna read a few poems from Obit. Let me start my timer because I'm not gonna read super long or anything. Um, and these are just uh, little poems that are shaped in obituary shapes. And um, my mother passed away in 2015 from pulmonary uh, fibrosis. And my dad, I think he, he leaks through some of these poems here and there and he had a stroke maybe about 15 years ago. So I'll just read a couple of these. Um, start with this one. Music. Died on August 7th, 2015. I made a video with old pictures and music for the funeral. I picked Hallelujah in a cappella because they weren't really singing, but actually crying. When my children came into the room, I pretended I was writing. Instead, I looked at my mother's old photos, the fabric patterns on all her shirts, the way she held her hands together at the front of her body. In each picture, the small brown purse that now sits under my desk. At the funeral, my brother-in-law kept turning the music down. When he wasn't looking, I turned the music up because I wanted these people to feel what I felt. When I wasn't looking, he turned it down again. At the end of the day, someone took the monitor and speakers away, but the music was still there. This was my first understanding of grief. Maybe I'll read um, uh, this poem. Let's see. It's also called Grief. Grief as I knew it died many times. It died trying to reunite with other lesser deaths. Each morning I lay out my children's clothing to cover their grief. The grief remains but is changed by what it is covered with. A picture of oblivion is not the same as oblivion. My grief is not the same as my pain. My mother was a mathematician, so I tried to calculate my grief. My father was an engineer, so I tried to build a box around my grief, along with a small wooden bed that grief could lie down on. The texts kept interrupting my grief, 
forcing me to speak about nothing. If you cut out a rectangle of a perfectly blue sky, no clouds, no wind, no birds, frame it with a blue frame, place it face up on the floor of an empty museum with an open atrium to the sky, that is grief. And I think I'll read this one, which is called The Clock. Oh, I just drew in my slide thing. Um, and I think this is the only poem in the entire book that's more than one page. <laughs> that's an obituary poem. The Clock died on June 24th, 2009, and it was untimely. How many times my father has failed the clock test? Once I heard a scientist with Alzheimer's on the radio trying to figure out why he could no longer draw a clock. It had to do with the superposition of three types. The hours represented by one to 12, the minutes where one no longer represents one, but five, and a two now represents 10, then the second hand that measures one to 60. I sat at the stoplight and thought of the clock, its perfect circle and its superpositions, all the layers of complication on a plane of thought. Yet the healthy read the clock in one single instant without a second thought. I think about my father and his lack of first thoughts, how every thought is a second or third or fourth thought, unable to locate the first most important thought. I wonder about the man on the radio and how far his brain has degenerated since, Marvel at how far our brains allow language to wander without looking back, but knowing where the pier is. If you unfold an origami swan and flatten the paper, is the paper sad because it has seen the shape of the swan or does it aspire toward flatness, a life without creases? My father is the paper. He remembers the swan, but can't name it. He no longer knows the paper swan represents an animal swan. His brain is the water the animal swan once swam in, holds everything, but when thawed, all the fish disappear. Most of the words we say have something to do with fish, and when they're gone, they're gone. I think I will now switch, and maybe I'll read one more of these at the end. I'm gonna switch to this book which is called Dear Memory, um, Letters on Writing, Silence and Grief. And it just came out maybe about three weeks ago. Um, and it really, you know, my friend, the poet Dana Levin really described it once as being kind of like a branch of the tree of Obit that kind of grew into its own tree. And I just thought that was really accurate um, because I really tried hard not to write the book Obit. And then I also tried hard not to write about my mother, and her passing again, but um, I ended up having to clean out a storage facility and I found a whole bunch of stuff, pictures, um, documents and things like that. And I, and I exited that storage facility having a ton of questions, but no one to ask them to. And, um, you know, I grew up in a family that was sort of populated with silence. And so um, it's not surprising that I didn't know anything about my, my background or my relatives or anything like that. So I, I wrote a letter to my mother and um, this is the first letter in the book. And it's a little longer than this, but not a ton longer, I'll read it to you. Dear mother, I have so many questions. What city were you born in? What was your American birthday, your Chinese birthday? What did your mother do? What did your grandmother do? Who was your father, grandfather? It's too late now, but I would like to know. I would like to know why your mother followed Chiang Kai-shek taking you and your six or seven siblings across China to Taiwan. I would like to know what was said in the planning meeting. I would like to know who was in that meeting, where that meeting took place. I would like to know the people who were left behind. I would like to know if there are other people who look like me. I would like to know if you took a train, if you walked, if you had pockets in your dress, if you wore pants, if your hand was in the fist, if you held a small stone, if you thought the trees were black or green at night, if it was cold enough to see your breath, to sting your fingers. I would like to know who you spoke to along the way, if you had some preserved salty plums, which we both love in your pocket. I would like to know if you carried a bag, if you had a book in your bag, where you got your food for the trip, why I never knew your mother, father, or your siblings. I would, like to, I would like to have known your father, to know what his voice sounded like, if it was brittle or pale, if it was blue or red, 
to know the sound he made when he swallowed food. I would like to know if your mother was afraid. During college, I spent several weeks with her in Taiwan. She bought me baozi or buns. Every morning, the bao that steamed in small plastic bags with no ties and sweet doujang, tofu milk, always too hot for me to drink. She sat there and watched me eat, complained to me about your brother's wife, complained of being sick and how no one would help her. Do you know how long it took me to figure out how to call an ambulance? And then when they came, she refused to go. I still remember how the two men stared at me as if I could move a country. Listen, it's the wind. That's the same wind from your countries. Sometimes if I listen closely at night, I can hear you drop a small bag at the door. I hear the sound of the bow touching the ground and the wind trying to open the bag. But when I open the door, there's nothing there, just the same wind, thousands of years old. Happy birthday, wind. Happy birthday, mother. April 6th, 1940. I know this now. All the nurses, doctors, and morticians asked me, so I memorized it. Your American birthday. April 6th, 1940, I said again and again, as if I had known this my whole life. Um, then I wrote a whole bunch of more letters. So I wrote letters to my grandmother, to my um, sister, to um, all sorts of people. And then I started writing to teachers and then um, abstract things like the body. And then I, at some point I started putting in some photos. So I'm not a visual artist. It's just, uh, I just want to put that out there. And, um, and so I started putting some photos in, in this thing that I was starting to take shape or so and, and writing a few tiny little poems. Um, and I put them on paper and I didn't want them to be fastened or glued on. So I'll just read you this short one. I think this was the first one I wrote. So it's really tiny. I hear the phone ringing but I can't answer it. It is silence calling. And there's one else. Okay, and then at some point I remembered that, um, and so this book really is a jumble of things and it's very organic. And I remember my mother uh, had gotten a letter from a, a long lost cousin in China. And so when my mother left, uh, China, the, the family bifurcated and one side stayed and the other side left and the side that stayed I mean, we don't know who they are, but she did um, get one letter once and their, um, their history is really tragic. And it sort of mirrored, uh, you know, the history of, of China during the Cultural Revolution, et cetera. And so um, I actually asked her, this, I think this is the one time my mother actually spoke about anything and I, I kind of pushed it a little bit. So I asked her to um, transcribe the, the letter for me. And then I asked her if I could record it. So I just, um, I'll just read a little bit, me. Have you heard from your relatives in China? Mother, I just found my cousin. She's two years younger than me. She just sent me a letter. She's had a very hard life. She has three daughters. Mother reads the letter. 1950, cousin and family moved to Huabei and had to learn new thoughts. 1950 to 59, every two to three days, they had to participate in new movements to suppress the revolution and to fight against the Americans. They had to take all of their pots and metal doors and burn them to make steel but moving away from farming led to starvation and famine. 1959 to 61, natural disasters chased or caused people to starve to death. People had no meat, no food. We had to participate in more movements. We had food coupons to eat. It took 10 years for things to improve. Suffering in the stomach was okay, but the mental suffering was what was unbearable. And I won't read the rest, but it's very clinical. And, and I thought that was really, interesting. Um, and because I didn't, I've never seen the letter, I don't know if my mother was making it really clinical or if the letter was actually clinical. Um, but later on, I, I learned that this, uh, the person's father, I guess the cousin's father uh, had a brain hemorrhage and he died when he was 51. And then in 1978, mother survived and had an okay life after that. None of us could go to college because we had been sent to the outskirts to do farming in 1980, we finally came home. So it kind of mirrored everything I learned in school about Chinese history. And it was very tragic because it personalized an entire um, half of a family that I have no idea who they are or what, um, what they're doing now. Um, and here's a letter to my grandmother. I won't read it, but I found, you know, it's very much so based on paraphernalia and ephemera and papers. I guess paraphernalia is not right. Papers, ephemera and um, various things. So this was based on a marriage 
a certificate of marriage that I have, a certificate that I found and then I just wrote a letter. Um, here's another one that I'll read this to you. I think this is a photo. I think it's of my great grandmother only because I think I look like her and my mother is in the top there. And these I think are all of my mother's um, siblings. And I think there could be maybe one or two more um, that maybe weren't born yet. So I'll read this to you. Once you had to stand behind your grandmother who left the country, each of your feet lifted off the land onto the boat like nightingales. I imagine the night sky, you below deck, light coming from two moons, but only half of your face lit up. You stood still as the moons rearranged themselves. During the switch, language was lost at sea. When language belongs to no one, a door opens. And I found letters. Um, my, my father worked at Ford Motor Company his whole career. And I found these, these little letters where he had perfect attendance. And I thought that was really funny. Um, but then I also thought it was kind of sad because I was looking at 1994. It was like, what was I doing during that time? I certainly wasn't thinking about my poor father who was you know, working really hard and had perfect attendance. So I wrote him a little poem and I put a little thumb imprint on the card um, to kind of mimic his own thumbprint. Was this your first job? Look at the window behind you as if leaving a country was all perspective and light. I wonder what is in your hand. It's so thin and small, it must be my home. Um, and I wrote more letters to teachers and things like that. I won't, I won't read them all to you, there's so, there's so many. Um, and messed around with things like guest checks based on some of the stuff that I transcribed from my mom's interview. Um, and maybe, let me check my time. Maybe I will, yeah, I'll just read one more poem from Obit and then I'll, I can't wait to hear Nikki read. Um, so this one is the penultimate poem in Obit and it was based on a, a writing prompt that someone asked me to do for terrain.org. They have this great letters to America series and initially I resisted because I hate writing prompts. Um, even though I deliver them all the time, but I uh, decided ultimately to try it. And so this was an experiment and um, it references the Marjorie Stoneman shooting in Florida. America died on February 14, 2018, and my dead mother doesn't know. Since her death, America has died a series of small deaths, each one less precise than the next. My tears are now shaped like hooks, but my heart is damp still. If it is lucky, it is in the middle of its beats. The unlucky dead children hold telegrams they must hand to a woman at a desk. The woman will collect their belongings in shadows. My dead mother asks each of these children if they know me, have seen me, how tall my children are now. They will tell her that they once lived in Florida, not California. She will see the child with a hole in his head. She will blow the dreams out of the hole like dust. I used to think death was a kind of anesthesia. Now I imagine long lines, my mother taking in all the children. I imagine her touching their hair, how she might tickle their knees to make them laugh. The dead hold the other half of our ticket. The dead are an image of wind. And when they comb their hair, our trees rustle. Thank you. Cool. Thank you so much, Victoria. Um, I love that uh, the idea of writing letters, especially to loved ones that have departed. I can definitely identify with that. I lost my father recent uh, a couple of years ago, and and the the questions that you wish you had asked, and you're kind of having conversations with these artifacts. I love how you arranged mm -hmm. arrange that. It's really powerful. Thank you. Yeah, and you all, you know you have all these questions, and you never you never it's like these questions you've never even thought about them before. That's what always amazes me. <laughs> right, right, and you're kind Thank of you. clinging to these little pieces and trying yep. to put things together. Yep. Yeah. Um. All right. <laughs> Our next poet is uh, from Wisconsin, but is joining us from Iowa, where she is a visiting professor at the Iowa Writers Workshop. Um. Nikki Washlager, her work has been featured in The Nation, Brick, American Poetry Review, Witness, and The Kenyon Review. She is the author of three full-length collections of poetry, Water Baby, Houses, and Crawl Space, as well as a graphic novel book called I Hate Telling You How I Really Feel. 
Um, she's also the author of an artist book called Operation USA. Um, and we're very excited to have her here today. Welcome, Nikki. Thank you. Um, I'd like to say when I wrote Water Baby, this um, was after my grandmother died. So a lot of this book is about grief as well. And it's, an, it's dedicated to her. So <clears throat> I can relate. <laughs> grief changes your life. <laughs> Nothing is ever the same. Valley of things. Hang your head when you walk. Yesterday's news is greener. To survive Hamlet's ideas of a common holiness. Decisions to make about what's going to siphon off your thoughts. Fuse giddiness to the citizen elective, creature by creature. When a very young child throws down an object, it's beautiful to watch. They don't know about the value of thinification hanging over the riverbanks. A good poet prays to nature. I brush out tangles during graceful animal hunting season. Sometimes we hear a crush, figure out a daily schedule, read tortured philosophers, listen to James Booker on repeat. Black woman on a plane, 21st century. Manusha in a bowl, jury rigged hand in need of a drink. The flight attendant said, it's on me. I must have looked like I needed one. Such a rough climb, wobbly as the sun during Leo season. Come to find out a brand new plane is hot to handle. The first breath, crucial, coughs. My favorite path of looking winds up when I'm in the air. There's no way to vacuum seal death up here, I suppose, even though I've never felt the urge to buy a traveling pillow. If something develops, if our machine defects, I'll ask if I can hold the hand of the woman who gave me a drink. Then it's time to land like nothing happened, the captain standing at the door with his crew. He's younger than I am, a baby-faced white boy. We don't know his name or where he came from. It's a daisy. Bats twin the sky, drowsy from billowing home to watch night court. I, Nikki, as a contemporary woman, am bound to ask who's spiraling in the faucet. If you keep no lie relaxers on your hair past, suggest, past the suggested time frame, the original crimple pattern becomes more defiant. Memories won't comfort me. Perhaps it's best not to trust the politics of people who haven't washed their own dishes in 20 years. Oh, missile management, I request a transfer for the masses, a happy howling cocktail showing instead of telling this country that I cannot with you. A free daylight may be possible, a revolt in us, I mean. Stems are still holding like a grown up, but they snap. You pick me up, pour me another bath, a glass of something dry for the blisters. Read Ted Jones's hand grenades, remember that. I'm not the only one and cry. When the devil leads us home and yells surprise. Is that your house, he asks. This used to be my house, I said. But those are not your people, so that can't be your house. But it is my house, I said. I had some people, maybe a few, even though those are not your people, even though they don't look like you. I had to live somewhere, I said. This is the house where I lived. But where are your people, he said. My people live in a different house. They don't care to know about me. If you're the devil, why are you asking me questions? The devil said, 
And the house you had a living is gone. I thought you'd be happy. It sure is a hot day, I said. Of course it is, said the devil. Why do you think I work in town? Way of the road. I closed my eyes so I didn't have to look at it anymore. When I opened my eyes again, it was still there. Same raggedy recollections, but I was farther down the road than the last time I was willing to rest. The road is an exasperating concept. I'd get sent to jail if I drove the car off into a field of ragweed and chicory, but in my mind, something resembling freedom would spark until the highway patrol came to take me away. Or tagged at birth with no excuses. Just follow it and swallow the signs. Once when I was a child, I was eating with my grandmother at a throwback hamburger joint. When out of the blue, someone drove a car into the side of the building. Turned out it was an old white man who had his foot on the gas pedal instead of brake. The cop arrived as we left. Certain the mystical fidelity of insurance would fix everything. The white man having been born with an excuse. Today is not an exceptional day. Almost every car we've passed is either a truck or an SUV. I feel ugly looking at them. When crossing the street, one is advised to look both ways before moving. This is a lesson we're required to learn in elementary school. Another one is never to accept rides from strangers. Serial killers wait in the wings of on-ramps, sucking down packs of energy drinks while listening to AM radio. It's rare I can remember names of officers, blueberries, cherries, fruits for the damned. You need to finish up your blunts and crotch the weed immediately when you see one around you. On the other side of the highway, bags are unpacked and German shepherd dogs bark and mildew over my overstuffed bladder buried underneath a rest stop. The past looks to the future with a portly film over its eye. A sack of goldfish breaks in the center line and when you get too close, it's gone. Recollections of dashed memories or reflections from a new mirage. Either way, the sirens are enlisted to stare when we don't belong, and the rights, we don't. So I close my eyes again. And when I reopen them, we've arrived at our destination. It's the grocery store parking lot, and they're having a sale on end of season vegetable starters. Blue Flame of July. Can't fix what's beyond repair. Baby, I know the feeling. A broke clock is right twice a day. Don't mean I'm gonna be healing. Any fool can make the rules. Any fool will follow them. I know in my soul that's right. Blue flame of, Ju Blue flame of July got me good and I can't stop the lies. Break me down before I become the same old fool I used to be. Can't fix what's beyond repair. Baby, I know the feeling. A broke clock is right twice a day. Don't mean I'm gonna be dealing. If a group of fools makes the rules, all the fools will follow them. Why can't we make better rules? Watch the biggest fools swallow them. I know in my soul that's righteous. Blue flame of July got us good. We've got to keep it moving. Break us down before we become even bigger fools than we used to be. I'll read a few more. Why do I feel so old when I look so young? Why do I feel so old when I look so young? Have a night of okay fun and I feel better and younger, refreshed, maybe lovelier, but in the morning, I feel just as old again. Hey friend, how are you? I see you're young too, around the same age as me. 
Look at those folks with their big boy pens and crooked chairs. They act younger than we do, and our lives are somewhere else, and the faces even older than these. When I was younger, people thought I was older, so they did older people things to me, said things too. Probably why I'm feeling old while I'm still looking young, because of what older people did when I was little, should have known better not to do. Say, friend, I hear you too. Things happen to you. That's the way evil goes. Let's people do bad things. Don't know why that is, but the how is inside the what. Tying the ends of the who. Maybe we can stop it from going to the next someone. Yes, it's like that. The could have, the should have, and the would have. If I would have known then what I know now, maybe I could have got out of the way. But I was too young and now I'm older. Outside the what and the who, but still inside the how and the why. Let me introduce my old ass self. How do you do? My name is Young, plus the last time I loved without fear. All right, one more. <laughs> Lost in America. Among the killings, among the permits, among the dull transparency, among the hunger, among the family beyond my reach, among the labor pool, among that type of grit, among the registered voters, among the paperless statements, among the eye of the beholder. I'm lost among your ethics, among the new world glossaries, among the pages of windows. I'm lost inside your mesosphere on what's toxic and what's not in America. I am certainly lost at the political match among reoccurring wars no one dares to injure on the ride home. Among the ink tracking, new moods helping to reimagine a world beyond the sunrise. Among the maps they used to leave in our hair. Celia got away, bad hip and all. Mm -hmm. Among electronic billboards jammed with the black faces of runaways. Don't call this toll free number if you see her armed and dangerous, healing from the law against marijuana fields owned by the same old, same old, against the embargo of time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikki. Um, as you can see, James has put in the chat links to purchase Water Baby and Dear Memory um, on bookshop.org. Uh, so check that out. And also if you have any questions for our authors, you can put it in the chat. Um, I know I have one question. Um, uh, I was reading an, an interview uh, that you did, I forget who it was with, Nikki, um, and where you talked about sort of when, when words fail and how there's like this gestational period of um, thoughts before like a writer or a poet can um, kind of put, put words to their feelings. And, and um, I think that grief, which both of you have kind of focused on, or a lot of your work focused on tonight, um, is one of those times, I mean, at least, especially when you like lose someone um, where there's so many strong emotions and things that come in and, and um, you can't quite put words to all of them. And I'm just curious how you both sort of knew when it was time to, if it happened at once or if it happened, you know, you, you put, like, when did you know it was time to sort of put words to those that the gestational period had ended and it was time to put words to those feelings or did it come gradually or was there a time when you knew it was time to start putting words to paper? I guess you can go on. No, I'd say, Nikki, you wanna go first? <laughs> well, um, I started writing Water Baby before my grandmother died. I just had a feeling something was going to happen. So I'm, this book is not just about her death, but like a lot of things that I'm grieving, like my father being absent in my life and all sorts of things. 
so I was already writing it. <laughs> and then, I mean, I, what else was I gonna do? <laughs> I had to do something to keep myself above, you know, water. Did yeah. it come in like fits and starts or like, um, did you, you know? Um, I don't really remember anymore. <laughs> It feels like a long time ago. So I've changed so much since then. Um, I mean, I've always wrote pretty steadily. Yeah. Yeah. It just comes like it always does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I usually spend about four to five years on each book, so. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I had the opposite experience in that I was trying to resist writing grief and writing about my mother's illness or passing. And so I, I, um, I also felt like the elegy was um, like, I just, I didn't know how to approach the elegy. I feel like it's been done in, before and many, many, many times by all these other people. And yet I knew that the elegy in its traditional form, if there can be one traditional sort of kind of elegy, didn't really speak to me. And so there's that kind of wanting to resist writing about my mother's passing and her illness, but also feeling like I didn't really know what, how to do it, you know? And so I waited a long time unintentionally. I just didn't plan on writing it. And then one day I just, um, I heard something on the radio and it triggered something and I went home and I wrote like 70 of these little obituaries over a two week period. So um, yeah, I resist, I resisted. And I think also, I don't know, I think it's nice to hear that that you write kind of consistently, um, Nikki, because I, I don't, and I kind of wish I did more so because then I feel like my poems would feel more different but I from each other, but I write in a very concentrated period of time. So small bursts, and then I have to figure out how to make them seem not so obsessive and similar. Um, but I think it's hard to write, write any sort of grieving poems or anything about grief because um, it, it, they're just such difficult emotions. And it's, mm. you know, you feel like, in some ways I felt like I was cheapening the experience of it by writing about it too. Um, and sort of commercializing it in some way. But then I also felt like with Nikki too, you know, it's like for me, I had to write it at some point because it made, yeah. I mean, as a writer, it's like, that's what we do. It's air, it's water. It's, it's what we, it was, it's what keeps us alive language. And so yeah. Yeah. in that way I ended up writing um, to, to keep myself going sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Thank Any you other? both. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions? Otherwise, I'm going to ask Nikki some questions. <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah, go ahead. Oh, me? Okay. You know, I while you're reading, Nikki, I was really interested in, I, well, I was, you know, I have your book, obviously. So I was looking at your poems um, while you're reading. And the, the thing I noticed about them is how they're also, they take all these different shapes. So you have, you know, couplets and, you have um, long lines, you have short lines, you have some poems that look more like prose poems. I mean, you really, you really do move around form a lot mm -hmm. in this book. And so I was curious to know, cause I get asked this question all the time. I was curious to know what your relationship to form is and, and how, how does form find its way into your poem? And do you kind of figure it out as you go or do you kind of shape it at some point later or do you move things around? Well, um, I do know when I write a longer poem and couplets that I'm really going to go off about something. <laughs> that's um, a friend said that's like a, my battleground form. So <laughs> like women are doomed to the angels of love and couplets. You know, it's like where I, I need to really flesh out something in a more complete way. Um, I love prose poems. Um, mm -hmm. I love writing them <laughs> very much. That's a good form for when I'm interested in like telling a little story. Mm. Um, 
Yeah, you have a lot of prose poems in here. Yeah. yeah. I, and actually, like my obituary poems, I mean, people have called them prose poems as, as well. I think prose poems actually are really difficult to write because you don't have, um, you're losing something large that po mm -hmm. poetry uses, which are line breaks. And line breaks are ways that tension can be built and it can you can sort of um, propel the narrative forward or slow it down with with line breaks. But when you don't have line breaks and you you only have a prose poem, I think you lose something, and then you have to. It's a hard you you know you almost have something that's missing, and so you have to make up for it in other ways. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I've been teaching the prose poem in my class, and I said you know cool. the key to a successful prose poem is to um, pay attention to rhythm mm -hmm. and um make your sentences like unusual like they don't have to be like a regular sentence mm -hmm. um but rhythm is the one i mainly like really stress a lot because that is what will make will, you know what you just said will be in place instead of the line breaks because i don't mm -hmm. make you as a reader to stop and start when you want that when you want the reader to stop and start and so it just doesn't just go on as like a paragraph of description. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, it's, yeah, it's, uh, I think that's true. I think I've, I think with um, prose poems, what I see a lot is that people don't think about all the tools that are available to us as poets and of which for them is one of them. And one of your favorite, my favorite poems in this book is your Robert Frost poem. And that's a great <laughs> example of, it's like, oh, comma, Robert, period. Like, oh, Robert go to bed and then and then it gets long I know these woods better than you do and your faithful horse is trying to tell you something you know so I think I think you're doing what you're talking about um, in terms of altering the rhythms to make uh, mm -hmm. the prose poem interesting and to build that kind of tension and also to create um, that kind of tonal variation but yeah that's one of my favorite poems in this book because of its attitude you know and, and I think that attitude <laughs> is um, evoked by the rhythm you know just it wouldn't like without oh Robert go to bed I think the poem wouldn't work quite as well so I think that's kind of what you're talking about yeah. yeah thank you does anyone else have any questions <laughs> otherwise I'll thank you for that back and forth I, I so so informative <laughs> yeah <laughs> You, you have more questions, Victoria? I have another one if no one else wants to ask a question. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, so another thing I noticed about Nikki, your your work is that that you use humor in interesting ways. And so <laughs> some of your poems are really, you have these moments of sort of funny humor and almost every poem, at least I heard that you read. Um, and the one I just mentioned, I think is hilarious. Um, the Robert Frost poem, it's it's funky and it has, uh, you know, attitude. And and the other ones that you read, like the black woman on a plane 21st century, there's no way to vacuum seal death. I mean, there's just like some really interesting, funny things. I mean, every single one. Um, uh, yeah, perhaps it's best not to trust the politics of people who haven't washed their own dishes in 20 years. You know, like there's there, and really every <laughs> single one. It's the grocery store parking lot, and they're having a sale on end of season vegetable starters. Um, so, what's your relationship to humor, and is that um, like how does because it's all there's also a lot of um, tragedy in your palms, and there's a lot of you know um, killings and violence, and and you you know you talk about um, some of the issues of related to race in America. Um, so yeah, how, how does humor fit into your poetry or your poetics in general? And is that something you do consciously? Yeah, that's very conscious. That's just who I am. I'm, I laugh mm -hmm. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a funny person. I don't think I could ever do stand up or something like that, but I put it in my poems. So you just do it naturally. You're not saying I'm going yeah. to try and make this funny. Mm -hmm. No, that's just, that's just, that's all me. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny, people have told me that my poems can be sort of funny sometimes too, but you're right. I don't actually think about trying to make things funny. I just think that um, for me, I also think that when I'm dealing with really heavy material, like things like grief or death or um, 
violence, you know, I think naturally I, I, I may sort of um, lean towards humor to kind of uh, give the poem a little more uh, dimension in terms of its emotional tone. Um, otherwise, I think a poem that kind of stays in um, that depth of grief the whole entire time, I think it would be hard to take that in some ways. And I think for me also, even amongst even within a book, you know, I think I vary the, the form and I have short little tanka poems in, to provide that kind of variation because I think staying within the space of grief for a long time is, it can be a little bit heavy, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. Yeah. You laugh to keep from crying, right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> And I just did a talk actually um, on joy in poetry. I did it uh, for the Breadloaf Writers Conference. And my, my key sort of thesis, if I had one, was that um, basically po poems of joy, you know, uh, Blossom's poem, Leung Lee's poem. I mean, all the poems that I looked at um, had, you know, were, are considered joy poems, but each, every single one has like a layer of darkness underneath or death. Um, or something that's pushing against that that joy. Um, you know, the refrigerator poem that Tom Lux wrote uh, with the maraschino cherries. Um, so yeah, I think I think for me the humor and the grief are are together, and one can't you know be without the other. In the same way, joy um, in a poem can't like if you read a poem that was all joyful, then it it doesn't really succeed as well if it's not countered with something like death. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't feel real. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, that's been real. something I've been thinking about my whole life because my mom and grandma are like that too. They have, that's who raised me. They have like just a really dry sense of humor. It's really kind uh -huh. of like a no, not, they're like no nonsense people. They're working yeah. in class, you know? So they always have all these weird little sayings and stuff, you know, they just, it, comedy and humor and like what makes people laugh and what's funny like this has fascinated me my whole life because mm. people will say you know the realest shit and it's like it's not it, it, it's not like pretty but it's funny because it's so I don't know real <laughs> for lack of a better term like that's why we watch comedians and they're up there saying almost like outlandish stuff and making people just roar mm -hmm. they're just they're they're doing something with yeah horrible things in this world mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's hey, a, yeah me too yeah me too i mean um i'll ask you a follow-up question then i'm gonna go to the chat there's a question in the chat but are there any poems or poets sorry of humor that you like like who, like po poets that you think are funny I thought of one while I just asked that question. Do you, do you, are there any poets that you, you kind of think are hilarious or funny? Um, I think Morgan Parker is pretty funny. Me too, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think Morgan Parker is hilarious and also really sad. Um, yeah. the, poems, the poems are really sad. Mm -hmm. And I think Human Win is really funny. I also think um, Chen Chen is really funny. Like I think those poets are are hilarious, but they're also um, there's also a lot of pathos and sadness in them mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Um, I'll I'll read the question in the chat. Thomas Tercera, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Can you talk about your use of visual material with your poetry? What does it add? Do you consider them visual poems? Um. I can answer that. And then I don't know if Nikki wants to answer that, but I think that for me, I've always had a very close relationship with visual art. And, and I think even in my first book of poems, I've written, um, I think of my po poems as, as being sort of like correspondences with things and I need things to press against. And art, visual art is one of those things that I've always written about. So ekphrastic poems, which are poems that are written um, responding to visual art. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I started um, doing a lot of visual art as a kid and then all the way through high school. And it wasn't until college I started writing poems. And, and so I've always kind of wanted to do some visual elements in some of my po poems and things. And um, so I tried it with In Dear Memory and it was really hard. And I'm really 
really not practiced. It's been so long since I've even drawn anything. Um, and but I'm working on a new manuscript now that that is a whole series of ekphrastic poems, and I am trying to incorporate some visual elements as well. Um, in terms of what I think they add, I mean, I think I think they're just interesting to look at, even if it's a failed visual art project. You know, I think I think it's nice for me to have those interruptions because I tend to be kind of an obsessive writer and consistent. And I write in short bursts. And so I think for me, having other things in a, a manuscript makes them more interesting for me. Um, do you want to answer that, Nikki? Um, do you ever? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I did my chat book with Bluff. Um, I, I hate telling you how I really feel, which was a bunch of photographs I took with a Barbie doll. <laughs> it's basically like a book of memes. Yeah, I definitely incorporate the visuals sometimes. Like when I when I get a little bored, it's just like writing poems. I will work on a visual project. Mm -hmm. Like a couple of years ago, I did an artist book with um, Container in Baltimore. And what they did was they sent their theme for this round of projects was to make an artist book out of a board game. So they sent me Operation. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's Woodland Pattern bought it, so that's where it is. That's where its home is now. But nice. um, yeah, there's that pictures. Sounds cool. Of I'm gonna go yeah. check that out. Yeah, that sounds really neat. Um, and then there's another question. Some Asian American poets use their, his, her mother tongue language in the works. Are you going to use it in a similar way in the future or are you in quite a different territory? Um, yeah, I, I was just reading Chen Chen's new manuscript, which I think is on the ground over there. And he uses some Chinese characters in there. And I love seeing them because I can read basic Chinese. And so it's really nice to, um, to recognize that. And then Shang Yang Feng, um, Shang Yang Feng is uh, a, a first um, book poet at our press, the press mate, and his book, Bearing the Mountain just came out and there are some Chinese characters in there as well. So it was really different when you can actually recognize um, some of those characters. But um, yeah, I have, uh, maybe seven or eight characters in this new manuscript that I'm working on in one poem. And then I also um, am doing some visual art with some, some characters and things like that. So yeah, totally, I'm gonna try more and more. Yeah. I mean, I'm um, always really happy to see when poets incorporate visual elements in their work. I don't think it's done enough. Me too. Yeah, I think I think it's happening more and more, though. You know, I think that that's what's exciting. Um, I have some friends who are visual artists and they're uh, incorporating their visual art into poetry. I think in the past it was more kind of considered to, like kind of new or there are cost issues with four color and things like that. And I feel like people are finally opening up to um, to the idea of doing more visual art and and um, collaging and things like that in their in their in their works, so. Um, well, it's five o'clock. I think, Didi, do you wanna, should we end or? Uh, if, if no one else has any more questions, I'll just thank you both again. Um, I, I really enjoyed your readings and then also this discussion that you've, you guys are clearly great teachers because you've curated a, a wonderful back and forth. Um, and I hope that you'll be able to join us in person at some point. Um, yeah. So thank you everyone for joining us and thank you, Victoria and Nikki. Yeah, thank it you. was great such weekend. a great pleasure. So nice to chat with you, Nikki. Hopefully we yeah, can do it in person lovely. sometime. Oh yeah, <laughs> and thanks for all the great questions and thanks for spending your Friday night with us and, um, and have a good weekend and support the bookstore, please. Oh. <laughs> Take care everyone. <laughs> thank Bye. you. Bye, Bye Nikki. Bye.